So good morning, everyone. My name is Shanice Hatfield and I'm Region 5 Lead Trainer. On behalf of Region 5 and Western Tide Water Community Services Board, I would like to thank you for attending Military Sexual Assault, Negative Perceptions and Barriers to Hope Seek, presented by Dr. Charlene White. A few housekeeping rules to keep in mind. I will be here monitoring the chat. Um, this training will be recorded. There are a few breaks throughout the training. Um, we're looking at maybe about 10, 30 ish and 12 o'clock ish, 50 minute break um, throughout the training or however Dr. White sees fit. Um, of course, if you need to use a bathroom or anything and step away from your computer, that's fine. Um, and you must be present to receive a certificate of completion. Unfortunately, we were not able to do CEs for this training, but I will be uh, distributing certificates of completion with the information and how many hours we were in the training. Um, and But do not send me any emails or anything yet because I'm going to wait until after the training and I'm going to ask for your names and emails, okay? Um, and that's pretty much it about uh, the housekeeping rules. Uh, I know that Dr. White is very engaging. So during the training, she's going to probably ask you to unmute. Um, she's going to want y'all to engage with her. And we're going to have a lot of uh, interactive things. Well, not a lot, but we're going to have a few interactive things she might actually read in there. But let me go ahead and talk about Dr. White. So Charlene B. White, LCSW, BCD, is a licensed clinical social worker. Shout out to the LCSW, y'all. Um, with the United States Air Force. She has over 23 years of extensive experience leading mental health and therapy programs and personal personnel for the United States Air Force in substance abuse, trauma stress response, sexual assault, suicide prevention, medical, social family, family maltreatment, and personnel resiliency. Ms. White, well, I'm gonna say Dr. White, is a skilled therapist, mental health education educator, and clinical program developer. She is the Integrated Operational Clinical Social Worker, 343 Training Squadron, Joint Base San Antonio, Texas. Additionally, Dr. White oversees a comprehensive psychological health program for the most extensive training unit in the United States Air Force. In this capacity, Dr. White is the focal point for coordinating psychological counseling and support for security force members. In addition, she acts as a consultant to the senior leadership to optimize psychological fitness and ensure operational readiness. While her experience has been diverse, she is most passionate about providing therapy through a trauma-sensitive, trauma-informed lens. Dr. White recently started her private practice to assist individuals in healing from transitional, transgenerational, and historical trauma. She trusts in transformed she trusts that transformation will occur when individuals are provided the support needed to draw on their strengths and view their trauma through multiple lenses, leading to the potential to live joyful lives. Dr. Wright received her bachelor's in social work from Texas Women University and her MSW from the University of Houston. She, it says she, oh, she has her doctorate from Barry University. And she's a diplomat of the American Board of Examiners and the Clinical Social Work. Thank you so much for attending this training, and I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Wood. Hello, guys. How are you all doing this morning? I'm excited to be here. Um, if you guys could just quickly just type in the chat um, your backgrounds, occupations, just so I can kind of know. I see some LPSWs here. Um, who else do we have in the audience? Put it in the chat, or y'all can go ahead and take yourself off mute. It's Friday morning. <laughs> can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay, because my Bluetooth, for some reason, is keeps going out. Oh, no, you're clear. We can hear you. I think some people are coming off mute. I'm a supervisee uh, in Virginia. Okay. Uh, emergency services clinician, resident counseling. Oh, resident in counseling. Okay, great. Resident counseling at the PAC. Is the PAC the VA? Clinical coordinator, LPC. Okay. LPC. Okay. Nice. All right. So, I have quite a few um, different backgrounds, mostly clinicians, I see, discharge planner, 
LCSW. Okay, good. So um, I didn't know the breadth and depth of the people who will be I would be speaking to today. So if for some reason this seems basic, um, you guys can unmute and just say, hey, okay, we already know this part. Okay, but I, I tried to teach this as lay as possible because I am military. So we're talking about military um, sexual assault. Of course, I'm going to talk about in the civilian sector as well, but I'm going to focus on military populations. So some of the stuff I try to like balance and not get too much in the weeds of military sexual assault, but at the same time, giving you information in case you are end up working with uh, veterans um, who have experienced sexual assault or if you're in an active duty or on a base, we do refer a lot of our members off base um, for therapy. And so you may see them or you probably have already seen them. All right, so we're just gonna get started. Um, and we're gonna just start first off with just the um, agenda. Just here's a disclaimer. I'm just gonna read this verbatim. The views expressed are those of the presenter myself and not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Department of Defense or the US government. And the topics of this training may include content that is graphic and sensitive in nature. Um, it may be upsetting at times and it may make it difficult to participate due to past exposure or personal experiences. Um, open dialogue is encouraged with respect to those around you. And please feel free to turn off your camera um, to take a break if you need to. Now, I don't like to hear myself speak, and I know you guys don't want to hear me, so I'm going to make this train as interactive as possible, which means I may call on you to ask you to read a slide or to see if you're awake or to type in the chat. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing. So feel free, though, to also unmute yourself if a question comes up or if you have a question um, about anything that I present. I talk fast sometimes, um, so also it's okay if you ask me to slow down. Just remind me, hey. Can you slow down? All right. All right. This is what we're going to be talking about today. Here's the brief agenda. Um, pretty basic things. We're going to talk about the myths. To, uh, we're going to define military sexual assault, how it impacts um, individuals emotionally, psychologically. We'll go into some reporting processes for the military and how we report sexual assault, um, legal consequences for the um, legal consequences and the victim's rights. Then we'll also talk about the context as it relates to military sexual assault. We'll talk about some clinical presentations of how um, victims may present to you who have gone through a sexual assault. And then I will also do some supportive services um, for our service members. And then this is the learning objective. And I don't want to read that verbatim, but we just take some time to look that over. The main thing is I really want to hone in on this number. Um, Five, participants should reflect on their own attitudes and beliefs about sexual assault, con consent, and gender roles, and be open to challenging um, and changing uh, harmful perspectives. Because a lot of times, <clears throat> what we find in the military, and I will go over this, is that when we send individuals or we, we have our own perceptions and beliefs and myths about sexual assaults, and sometimes um, it hinders us from being able or creates barriers for us to be able to provide um, treatment for individuals who have experienced a sexual assault. So really just checking ourselves and checking our baggage when we have um, individuals in our office who have experienced this section. Any questions about the learning objectives? Okay. All right, so we're going to go into some myths. Um, and again, some of these are base, very basic, and you may be like, why are you talking about this? But again, these are things that people still believe um, when it comes to sexual assault, okay? So... I may ask you to uh, read the myth for me, please, if someone wants to just kind of read the first one. Victims lie about being sexually assaulted out of guilt or to get revenge. True. Um, and so we know that we know that this is a why. Why do you think this is a, a myth? Anybody have a experience with this? So the reality is that false reports, um, victims rarely, rarely make false reports. Um, and there are no more false reports than there are any other crimes, which is about 6%. Um, so which that means that about 90, what, 95, 96% of the um, cases that are presented are true, okay, and not false. Yeah. Um, Dr. White. Yes. I, I've um read this or interpreted differently. I thought it was saying like victims lie about being sexually assaulted, meaning like they don't report it out of guilt, but then I seen to get revenge. So then I was like, oh, okay, no, that's wrong. 
but I thought like they don't talk about it because like out of guilt or shame hold, hold on let me try to fix this sound again I'm sorry let me try to connect one more um, because I hear you but it's very vague can you hear me now mm -mm. I can type it in the chat okay and let me try. To, I think I'm going to try. To can you repeat the question? Maybe I can. Um, I can say it. Yes, I was just saying. I guess I interpreted the sentence wrong because I read it fast. I was under the impression that it was saying like victims don't come forward about being sexually assaulted. Like, so I guess they lie. They're saying like it's not happening when it did happen out of guilt or shame. Like they felt shame, but then I saw or to get revenge. And I was like, oh no, that that's not the case. But I was seeing it from the other side where it was like, they're not reporting it because of- Right, you know, no, no. This one is saying that the myth is that people say, they will say that victims lie out of, um to get revenge for someone. Like they want to, they lie about being sexually assaulted out of guilt. Like maybe they had sex with someone and now they feel bad about it. So now they're going to lie or they are- where they broke up with someone and now they want to get revenge. So that's basically what this one is saying. Does that, did that answer? Am I answering your question? Yes, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to go back and clarify that 6% of sexual assaults are reported to law enforcement and um, 2 to 4% of those are false allegations, which is no different than other um, crimes. Okay. And so as you said, so 96 to 98% of sexual assaults that are reported are true. And I hope I answered the young lady's question who got me earlier. I don't remember the name because I didn't see it on the screen. Um, okay, the next one. Wow. All right. Prostitutes cannot be raped. All right, so we know that this is a myth because why? The scent is scent always. All right, and sexual assault can happen to anyone regardless of their socioeconomic status, um, who they are, where they work, where they live, race, color, creed, sexual um, orientation. It does not matter. Sexual assault does not discriminate, and it's just not. Um, geared toward one certain group of population. All right, can someone read that one for me? If, the, if there was no penetration by a penis, then there was no rape. What do you guys think about that one? Someone said it kind of early when they talked about um, power and control. And so the definition for um, rape is, of course, there has to be consent, right? The key thing with we're talking about consent, and um, most uh, states and jurisdictions recognize that um, penetration does not necessarily equal uh, sexual assault. So we know that there does not have to be uh, penetration for sexual assault to occur. Um, we got a whole bunch of falses in the chat. We got about three falses. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. So yes, that is false. How about this one? If a, if a woman drinks with a man, goes home with them, or wears skimpy clothing, it is her fault if she is raped. Um, the falses are coming in. We have victim blaming, false, false, false. All correct, right? Because sexual false, assault false. is never the victim's fault. Um, sexual violence is, is a violent attack on an individual. Um, and it is not spontaneous crime or passion. And no one, we know this, that no one asked to be sexually assaulted. Definitely blaming and shaming. And we still see that, um, even when we hear cases about sexual assault, I mean, I still think about um, the Bill Cosby situation, and, you know, sometimes victims come forward very late, 20 years, 30 years later, and you'll have, I've heard people just kind of say, well, why was the person, the woman going to the room at 3 o'clock in the morning if she didn't want so you hear those kind of things. So again, that victim blame. 
What about this one? Saying no is the only way of expressing your desire to not continue. What are some other ways that you could think of? Um, I see some bosses in the chat. Um, but what are some other ways um, to say no without saying no? Please feel free to unmute. Pushing the person away. Yes, uh-huh. Pushing the person away. Just leaving. Leaving, uh-huh. Well, if you're like engaging and then you're like, mm, I'm not sure, is that is that a way of saying no? Stop. Yes, yes, stop. Um, what if I'm I'm saying I'm not sure right now, I'm crying, or maybe I'm silent. And what and when we talk about consent, we know that um when you're intoxicated, you can't give consent. So if someone is intoxicated, that's another way of saying no, right? If they're intoxicated, unconscious. Um, those are all ways of saying no without actually saying no. Okay, even if the person presents as scared, that's also a form of no or uncomfortable, not sure. Again, those are all ways of saying no without actually saying no. What about this one? If it really happened, the woman would be able to easily recount all the facts in proper order. Now we know um that out of sheer out of just sheer fear um shock we cannot remember because of how the body responds to trauma or traumatic events that prevents us from sometimes being able to remember um how how it happened or the specific details again because our body um is changing right and also if you have memory loss you can if you were drinking the night before or during that incident you could have loss of memory due to alcohol so not necessarily because um it didn't happen. And of course, our brain does block out traumatic events. Okay, how about this one? Can somebody, uh, rape is most often per perpetrated, sorry, perpetrated by a stranger. Yes, false. Because we know that most rapes occur by someone that we know. A neighbor, a friend, someone we're dating. And the statistics show that 82% of sexual assault are um, happening by, by someone that we know or acquaintance. For military populations, most uh, sexual assault happen on the military base in military housing. And how about this one? Now I kind of gave you the answer, right? But there are people who believe that sexual assault does not happen in the military. And as if you guys watch the news or see anything lately, we have had an uh, increase in sexual assault by higher ranking military people, all the issues that you saw at the academy, at basic military training. Um, but we know that sexual assault does happening in the military. All right, so I'm going to, oh man, Shanice, do you think you can like play this video? I'm scared. Yes, <laughs> um, give me one second. Thank you. Um, so what did you guys think about that? Did you see the um, myths, some of the myths that we talk about? Any feedback on the um, video? That was a, a military member who served. He's no longer in the military, but he does do, uh, he comes and talks to different organizations, military bases um, about sexual assault. So what did you guys think about that? Is there anything that you didn't know that we knew? Um, any feedback? I did not realize um, the statistics for males who were sexually assaulted. So I found that very interesting. Yes. And we're going to talk about that a little more uh, in detail about men. I have a section for 
um, men because again that is the under talked about group and even when we refer to or talk think about sexual assault we immediately think about women even in our advertisements um, the military is doing a lot better with considering uh, men and showing advertisements that have to do with men and using men in scenarios um, but again we mainly do focus on women anybody else Okay, I was going to say, yeah, hello. Yes, I'm okay. Dietrich, Dietrich Baker. I was, uh, what I got out of what he said was that she failed to report because afraid of being judged. So that's yes. what I got. Yes, yes, afraid of being judged. Um, because again, in the military, um, again, we're going to talk about the process for uh, reporting and how that works. But there is a lot of judgment, just even in the civilian sector when we talk about sexual assault the judgment of you know what like i was out at one o'clock in the morning and what did he say you know we know that we nobody nothing good happens after 12 12 it's like open um game for me to do whatever i want your body is free so if you sat down and you had dinner with me again like we talked about that's one of those myths or my skirt was too short or so yes fear of the repercussions if they do report and the judgment anybody else have anything Yes, you know, you just said when they said I was out at 12 o'clock, um, as I was listening to that and listening to you say that again, I recall when um, I was younger and my parents used to say stuff like that. And um, so it's it's just amazing how um, just kind of, I, I flash back to what my mom and dad said. I'm like, dang, you know, wow. You know, um, just because you choose to stay out a tad bit longer, you know, it's like nothing ha nothing good happens after 12, you know, only those types of women are out at that particular time. So I guess depending on uh, when you were raised, you know, I'm not too sure so much about how that's being perceived or if it's being said with the younger generation now, but, you know, just back when I was coming up, you know, just reflecting on that. Yes. That is still being said because even with the young population that I work with, I work with the military, um, trainees for security forces here in san antonio and yes we they we still say that like and i still hear them saying it. and of course maybe they, it's because like you said their parents are saying it, or they may hear their grandparents saying it, but it's still nothing even our service members who are who are in basic training or in tech school you know they have a curfew um and so that curfew is 11 or 12 o'clock you should not be out you can't be out of your out of your dorms um and so yeah we still say that be back before 12. So it's still being said because, again, they believe in if you're out late, there's nothing good that happens when you're out past 12, right? And unfortunately, you should not have to um, worry about being sexually assaulted at any time. Anything else? Thank you guys for um, sharing your comments. It made me think of, too, um, <clears throat> from a male perspective sometimes, like when you were talking about what you're wearing or how you look, from females, I remember hearing, like, red lipstick or the long nails or certain things like that and then males sometimes I hear um an outpatient like I was at the beach or I was out I didn't have my shirt on and then she touched me or something like that so it's really like that double standard but reinforcing that it does happen to both uh genders mm -hmm. yes yes thank you for sharing that would you like me to share my screen um, or would you, are you okay? Yeah, can you, do you want to? That's fine, yeah. because you could, I have another uh, couple of um, yeah. videos. But, you know. <laughs> It'll probably be easier. Thank you. I got yourself. you. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, now we're gonna talk about some uh, definitions. Um, and the first definition has to do with mil really military sexual assault. And this is how it's defined by the Department of Defense. If someone wants to read that for me. No takers. Intentional sexual um, contact characterized by the use of force, threats, intimidation, or abuse of authority, or when the victim does not or cannot consent. Sexual assault includes rape, um, forcible sodomy, oral or an, an, anal um, sex, and otherwise, I mean, other unwanted sexual con contact um, that is aggravated, um, abusive, or, I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses on, or wrongfully 
including the unwanted and un inappropriate sexual contact or attempts to commit these acts. Thank you. And I do see that type of there. And I thought I corrected that. But anyway, um, yes, thank you for sharing that. And it does. Um, when we talk about sexual assault, the key thing here is um non-consensual, okay? Um, and if it could be what happens in the military is it is occurs between um we have this rank structure. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, we have officers are enlisted, but then we have higher ranking enlisted and lower ranking enlisted, and then you have the higher ranking off officer and then lower ranking. And so you may see the cost um the power and control dynamics, we're going to talk about that just between the, the sheer structure of the rank structure um, when we're talking about sexual assault. All right. So that's the definition that we as a military use when we're talking about um, sexual assault. That's the DOD. So the Air Force, Army Guard, um, we all use that uh, definition. Next slide. Now, military sexual uh, trauma, this is a VA term, not a Department of Defense. Um, and this definition is, it says sexual assault or repeated threatening sexual harassment that occurred while the veteran was serving on active duty or in active duty training. So, um, so you know, we have reservists and then we have the active duty component. So the reservists are those individuals who come one weekend out of the month. They're the ones that typically may deploy. Um, they activate for a deployment um, and then they go back to their civilian jobs. Um, so if you're in active duty training, if it occurred while you were in basic training, or if you're in tech school, if you're in officer training school, um, and so more individuals typically report, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but um, you'll see lower numbers of reporting in the military, and lots of people wait to get out. The veterans wait until they're no longer in the military, and then they report to the VA, um, and they may report the sexual trauma. So that's the VA term, and a lot of times we use those simultaneously, but it is a term that uh, the VA uses. Next slide. Sexual harassment. Anybody want to read that to me for me? Or if you just have a definition of what you think sexual harassment is. Sexual harassment involves unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and deliberate or repeated offense commit comments or gestures of a sexual nature when one. Submission to such conduct is mode either made either explicitly or implicitly the term or condition of a person's job, pay, career. Two, submission to or rejection of such conduct by a person is used as a bias for career or employment decisions affecting that person. Three, where such conduct has the purpose or effect of reasonably interfering with an individual's work performance or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment. Thank you. What does that look like? Does anybody have an idea of what that, any of one of those one, two, or three, what that would look like or an example of that? Um, anybody? So in the military, a, we may see, a, oh, go ahead. A junior enlisted uh, personnel is requested by a senior enlisted personnel to do different acts um, with the intention of eventually having some type of sexual advances toward them. Correct. Yes. And then they may also use um, position, like say, for instance, maybe I want to apply for a, a, a particular job. Um, and so they may say, if you do this, then I'll allow you to, you know, PCS here, or I can help you get, I can help you get PCS here. Or, um, even so much as farther as I need to get a humanitarian move because maybe someone in my family is sick. And if you do this for me, um, then I will allow that to happen for you. So do see that. Or maybe you want to apply for a special duty um, and that same thing happens. Um, so career, paid job, all of those things are impacted. Oops, sorry, I went back. Okay, next slide. Consent. Now, this is the key because this is what sexual assault encompasses, right? Consent is the main um, component of sexual assault. And without consent, then it is sexual assault, right? Somebody want to read to me um, the consent definition? This is what we use for the military. Words are over, over actions indicating freely given agreement to engage in sexual activities. It is the mutual between all parties involved. It must be obtained regardless of how a person is dressed or the past sexual history 
of or with that person. Consent cannot be given if someone is placed in fear, threatened, or incapable of giving consent. There is no consent where the person is sleeping, incapacitated, such as due to age, alcohol, or drugs, or mental incapacity. And I really want to thank you so much. I really want to hone, hone, hone in on the number um, consent cannot be given if the person is sleeping. Because a lot of times we misinterpret that, right? Like people don't understand that. If I'm asleep and you're trying to have sex with me, that is not consent, right? Um, if I'm intoxicated or I'm drunk, I cannot fully give consent because we are not in our right minds if we're if we're intoxicated, correct? So it's a mutual, like I said, between both parties, everyone needs to be involved. We need to both be in agreement, whether we're showing that through our body language or in agreement, um, or if I am verbally saying that I agree. So again, the key thing that we really focus on in the military is consent, consent, consent. Without consent, you cannot do it. And so we really kind of stress that keep your hands to yourself. Um, so next slide. This is the last definition, I think. Anybody with retaliation? And I'm going over these because we're going to talk about these things and you're going to see these things in some of the scenarios. So I just want to kind of give you the brief um, definition of these terms. This is the last definition, guys. One more. An act that wrongfully takes or threatens to take an adverse personnel action or wrongfully withholds or threatens to withhold a favorable personnel action with respect to any person for making or preparing to make a protective communication, i.e. reporting a sexual assault. It is an umbrella term that can include ostracism, maltreatment, cruelty, reprisal, or criminal acts and can pertain to victims, bystanders, and witnesses. Right. Thank you so much for that. So when we when we think about retaliation, um, again, these are some examples of if I witness a sexual assault and I go and I report that um, to the security forces or law enforcement here on the base. And then after the investigation starts, my um, supervisor starts to... Um, punish me for that. So maybe I was scheduled to um, go on a, a TDY or I was scheduled to take leave and then now my leave starts to be denied or people stop talking to me in the unit because I filed this um, sexual assault. Um, so that's kind of what we talk about when we talk about retaliation. And many times in the military, individuals do not report because of the fear and perception of retaliation. So the military is doing really a great job. DOD is doing... Um, so many great things to try to prevent uh, retaliation to help people come forward, victims come forward um, with sexual assault. So we have come a long way. Um, I think somebody wrote in the chat that they saw like something from like 1960s. Yeah, like sexual assault has been an ongoing. It has been a cultural norm, right, in the military for years. And so just here recently, we are really trying to um, stop it, recognize it, acknowledge that it does happen and really trying to support our victims and um, punish those who are or perpetrators who do a uh, sexual assault. All right, next slide, please. And military sexual assault, the significance. Okay, so again, the reason why it's significant in the military is because it destroys camaraderie. Um, it tarnishes the reputation of the military and recruitment. Um, it undermines the trust, cohesion, and morale within the military units. Um, and it affects our operational readiness and mission, um, mission effectiveness. Not to mention it also, you can suffer from emotional and physical trauma. So that's why it's important for us to address this in the military, because if we have this and it's considered the status quo or the norm, um, it does destroy morale. And we've seen many times where even now when we talk about military, you see that this is the first um, year that no military branch met their quota. And I'm not saying that that's because of sexual assault, but I'm saying it's because, you know, things are rapidly changing and the military just does not hold its uh, value like it used to. Like it used to be very prestige, you know, to be in the military. And now sometimes it's not. I think that we see um, significant changes where people are not wanting to join the military. They don't see that it's a, a good thing because we start to see all of these issues coming forth within the military. Any questions about um, the definition? Okay, next slide. 
And so what constitutes sexual assault? Military sexual assault refers to, like we said earlier, non-consensual sexual activities that occur within a military context. It can include unwanted sexual contact, advances, or behaviors that violates a person's boundaries. All right, next slide. And these are the types of military sexual assaults um, that can occur. And we know that military sexual assault can occur on or off base. Um, and these are just some definitions. I'm not going to go over each one of them. Um, we are talking about sexual harassment. We are talking about rape. Um, un unwanted touching or groping is, of course, following someone um, without their consent. It may be you, maybe let's say you are um, standing um, in line waiting to um, get a soda in the defect cafeteria is what we call it, the sex is what we call it in the military, and someone starts to kind of rub on your shoulder, or maybe they're like rubbing on your back, um, that is considered unwanted touching, right? Um, and then unwanted sexual advances, making unwelcome sexual, um, I can't see my screen no more, um, but anyway, so again, just making sure that these favors of discomfort, um, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so then we also have, a, this is something that we see with this newer popul population of military and the new uh, generation, right? Is this non-consensual sharing of explicit content. So sharing intimate pictures, videos, messages without the person's um, consent. And that's what we all, they call it, as, uh, referred to as revenge porn. But we do see that often, um, more so in the military than we have in the past. We are seeing that more so. Um, and then again, I want to reiterate again, this sexual assault by a person of authority, because again, the rank structure, and we're going to talk about this a little bit further, that power and control of the rank in the military, which is, you know, you're here and I am taught to respect my authorities, respect those who are over me. You know, I sign an oath, I swear in. And so it becomes very conflicting. It's a conflict of who I am as a person and what just happened to me. Um, do I report this person or do I not? Because I respect this person. Um, because they're over me and this is what I'm taught to be loyal now I'm, is this loyal now am I now no longer loyal um and so we'll talk about that a little bit later next and then we know that MSA which is military sexual assault military sexual trauma is an experience and not a diagnosis and so we know that we need to not um sometimes we will diagnose someone and say that they sexual um it's, they have sexual assault or sexual trauma, but that's not the diagnosis, right? So we need to really focus on the experience, the act of the event. And this is a knowledge check. You can just type in your um, answer uh, on the in the chat. Intentional and unwanted sexual touching or attempts to touch another person. Um, of another person when that person does not give or is not capable of giving consent is the definition of correct a sexual assault thank you guys all right now we're going to talk about the prevalence rate any questions so far before i go into the prevalence All right, so this is, I think that we are due for another um, workplace and gender relations survey of active duty members for 2023. So this is the most recent one that we um, have. And so as you can see with um, military, this is just strictly um, active duty military. This does not include the reservists or the guard or, um, yep. Yeah. So but this is just us. Um, so this is what we see. Of the um, 229,000 uh, women, um, 8.4% 4, 8 of them have experienced a sexual assault, right? And then for men, out of the 1 million, over 1 million men in the military, 1.5 of them have experienced a sexual assault. So that equates to, like I said, there are 19,000 um, men, which is a total of about 35,000 total um, for that year that, we, that we've seen sexual assault in the military. Next slide. All right, this is just the overall prevalence of what we see. So um, versus civilians, so veteran, lifetime veterans, so this is veterans, those people who are, you know, they can be in the military or not in the military because they still consider them to be veterans, um, versus civilians, 
So overall, um, for females and and uh, civilians and veterans, we see that there's a higher rate, 24% for female veterans versus the civilian population and then males is lower. But if we just look at the overall statistics um, of that, military members or veterans um, experience sexual assault more so than the civilian sector. Any questions about that slide? All right, next. And this is just the rate of PTSD, which I thought was interesting because out of all of the trauma events, right, the, you know, disaster, accidents, um, any type of assault other than sexual, um, it could be physical assault or, and then sexual abuse, combat, rape. Um, so out of those people who have experienced rape, right, um, over 50 something percent of them experience a uh, PTSD afterwards. They develop PTSD, which I thought was very interesting. So as we know, so we see quite a bit of PTSD due to rape um, in the military uh, as well. So and this is just, it's, she looked at military populations. And so this is what she um, found in her research. Any questions about that slide? All right, next. All right, so now we're going to talk about the military, uh, the impact of military sexual assault um, and how the body responds to it. Um, a person to a person's response to sexual assault, like we know, can be varied um, by person to person and it's very personal. Um, but on the under, but on the other hand, there is little to no response um, to the violence that has been taking place. And so the body chooses um, to may choose to move forward from that damage. Um, and that may be good in some circumstances. So just next slide, sorry. Yes. And so this is the impact um, that sexual assault can have on you emotionally, right? The emotional impact of sexual assault. And we see a lot of uh, shame and guilt, right? Um, victims are awfully unfair, often unfairly treated um, or blamed. So that internalized the shame and guilt, the self-doubt, doubt. Um, they are wondering what they did wrong. How could they have uh, prevented it? And we also see isolation where we start to withdraw. We're not connected to our peers. We're not connected to our friends and family. So we isolate. We use this emotional numbness as a form of coping. Um, and we find it difficult to express our feelings after experiencing that. So that's emotion. Anybody have any other um, emotional impacts that are not listed there? Next slide. And now we'll talk about the psychological um, impact of sexual assault. And this can involve uh, difficulty concentrating, um, random emotional outbursts. We may have, you may see some substance uh, abuse. When we talk about the psychological impact, of course, we see PTSD and we have high rates of PTSD in the civilian and uh, military sector. Um, after experiencing a uh, sexual assault, trust issues are also seen. We see the disassociation, um, difficulty developing relationships. Typically, after a sexual assault, individuals may experience issues with trust um, and being able to reestablish healthy relationships for years. The, the impact of sexual assault has a lot long lasting impact on individuals. Next slide. And then we just talk about the physical impact. Um, in cases of uh, violent assault, you may sustain injuries that may require medical attention, chronic health issues afterwards, and I can talk about such as headaches, digestive issues, uh, sleep disturbances, um, sexual dysfunctions. Um, victims may experience sexual dysfunction, including pain, discomfort, or difficulty engaging in intimate relationships, which that one is key because it is difficult um, to engage in intimate relationships after being um, sexual assault and then also suicide. We see um, suicidal ideation and an increase in suicidal um, and self harm um, after a sexual assault, just because of the the issues with coping and not being able to cope. And then it goes back to those feelings of depression, um, and they just are not able to kind of deal or manage the handle the trauma. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, would somatic symptoms too be part of this? Do you see a lot of somatic symptoms like maybe after the assault, their shoulder might hurt even though their shoulder wasn't compromised in the assault or anything like that? 
yes, you we will see that. So you will see, um, like we said, different things. Like we talked about, like I said, the, the headache. So you'll see the shoulder, or you might have someone who has neck pain and that wasn't involved in that. Because again, we know that trauma um, is held in our body, right? And so our body does respond to that trauma, um, even though it wasn't necessarily a physical um, assault or a physical injury that took place. But we do hold body. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Body Keeps the Sport, but it talks about how um, our body will hold the trauma. We may have neck pain, we may have leg pain, we may have um, shoulder pain, stomach. We may have some stomach issues or gut issues, and all of those typically are contributing to trauma. And once we manage and deal with that trauma, you start to see that those somatic symptoms start to dis dissipate and disappear. That was a good question. Anybody else? Okay, next slide. And then we know this, but I wanted to just kind of reiterate that when sexual trauma is experienced during military service, it is more strongly associ associated um, with negative outcome, mental health outcomes than sexual assault experienced before and after military. So when you have a sexual assault in the military, right, it happens in the military, um, you're more likely to have negative mental, mental health um, issues or concerns such as depression, anxiety, PTSD. Um, those are the main ones that we see, again, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, co um, completed suicide. So you're more likely to see those type of issues um, if you have a, a sexual assault that occurred during your military service. Next slide. All right. Before we get into the reporting um, options and processes, does anyone have any other questions? Would you like a, to take the break during this part? Is this a good oh, break? Yeah. Yes, this, this is fine. All right, let me give me a second. I'm going through it. Sorry. All right, so we could take a 15. Yeah, that we doing math. So 15 minute break. There'll be about 10:25. Um, so I'll put it in the chat. So if we could all please return at 10:25. Here in October. Okay. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Hope that you were able to get up, stretch, and not look at your computer for a little bit. We're going to go ahead and jump right back. Oh, I'm the one sharing the PowerPoint. Okay. Here we go. My bad, y'all. I forgot that was. <laughs> and here we go. All right. So now we're going to go into uh, military um, reporting processes and how we report. You can go ahead to that slide. And so this is kind of how, um, if you were involved in a sexual assault in the military, these are the options that we have um, for reporting a sexual assault. Um, so a rest restricted report, it just basically um, allows the victim to report the sexual assault without um, having a formal investigation or without it being reported to their commander or law enforcement. Right, but they can they're still allowed to receive all of the same um, helping agencies or treatment. Um, they can get counseling, they can get um, they get assignment of a SARC, which is our sexual assault response coordinator, and then you have the sexual assault prevention and response um, victim advocate. And this they can get all of these services um, and treatment without having to do a restricted um, a, a formal investigation. So that's what restricted reporting is. Um, and next slide. Anybody have a question about restricted reporting? We're going to talk about that a little bit more, but then we have unrestricted reporting. So this is, if, let's say I have a sexual assault and now I want to report it to um, law enforcement. I can go this unrestricted route, which then that opens up an investigation. Um, it's not confidential any longer, right? So um, now the commander is made aware of the sexual assault and then it has to be reported to um military uh, law enforcement OSI to start the investigation process. And this is typically done if someone wants to um, file for conviction or they want to um, have, a, like I said, an official investigation. So that is what we have for, so we have two reporting options in the military, which is restricted and unrestricted reporting. Next one. And these are the mandated reporters for um, sexual assault in the military. If someone, if I'm a commander, I'm a mandated reporter, 
within the chain of command. That's in, that includes our supervisors, your first sergeant, senior enlisted advisors. Um, if they hear of a sexual, sexual assault or someone comes to them and tells them that they've been sexually assaulted, they are mandated report to men. And then instructors, except for the academy, so like we have instructors in a basic training, tech school, um, officer training school, all of those instructors are mandated reporters. And then of course we have our law enforcement, which includes security force. So if they are aware of a sexual assault happen on base or off base, or if they're off duty, so that's why we say we're in the military, we're uh, on duty 24 seven, right? But if you're a law enforcement agent and you hear of a sexual assault and you're not on duty, let's say you're gonna leave, you on vacation, you are still mandated to report that sexual assault. Questions about mandated reporters, because I think that's important. Um, I medical, we are not mandated reporters, and we'll talk about that. So medical staff, um, chaplains, those we're not uh, considered um, mandated reporters, and therefore um, individuals can come to us and talk to us about a sexual assault, and we do not have to report that to leadership. Next slide. And so this is kind of how the reporting process um, goes. We, first of all, we want to ensure, you know, the safety and the well-being of the victim, right? So we want, if they need medical attention, we want to make sure that that happens. Then we also make sure that we provide support um, and make sure that they have access to those needed so, uh, resources that I mentioned earlier, as far as like medical care, counseling, legal team. And then we already talked about the reporting options again. So they have the choice. And you make sure that you give the member the choice um a great reporting option they have but if they go to the command typically they don't have um the choice of a unrestricted report or restricted report if they are go to the leadership right um but so again it tells you here that he, these are the people who are can take or disclose um they can disclose their sexual assault to the in a restricted report to any health care providers the chaplain, the victim advocate without initiating an official investigation. And I think that's important because before um, individuals would report sexual assault and they may report it to, you know, um, a healthcare professional, but let's say someone hears it in the hallway, maybe there's someone's walking in the hall and they hear that so-and-so was in, uh, experiencing a sexual assault, then they go and they tell that person's supervisor. Now, because their supervisor was made aware, now they have to report the sexual assault to leadership. Um, Next slide. And then we already talked about the unrestricted report. This is this is where notification is made to the chain of command. There's very limited confidentiality in this um, process. And again, um, legal authorities are involved. And then of course, we report reporting to the chain of command. If the victim chooses the unrestricted reporting, they typically report the incident to the chain of command. Um, and this could be like the supervisor, platoon leader, or any other appropriate. And then a formal investigation then takes place. Um, with unrestricted report. Again, um, restricted reports do not initiate a um, formal investigation. You cannot go from um, unrestricted, you can't go from restricted to unrestricted, okay? So once you're restricted, you stay, um, I'm sorry, once you're unrestricted, you can't go to restricted. So once you open that up and you say you want to investigation, you cannot change your mind, but you can choose not to participate in the investigation, um, which means that you may choose that you don't want to um file charges or you don't want to discuss the incident and they the military can continue to have court hearings and investigate the um sexual assault without your participation so before uh victims did not have the right not to participate they were made to participate but now they have the option to not if they choose to whether they do um again unrestricted or restricted any questions about the restricted and unrestricted reporting does it make sense to you guys This is a lot of information. Y'all gonna have to get off mute and say something. something. <laughs> are y'all familiar? Are, who is all like, who's familiar like with the military process of reporting? Do I have any? Um, I am. Sorry, veterans. I am because I'm a veteran, so I'm quiet to see if I've missed anything, if anything's changed. Um, and really, what it looks like. You, when did you uh? When did you uh, retire or separate? Uh, 2007. Oh, to, oh, yeah, a lot of it's changed since 2000. Right, so I'm quiet. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so we we made a lot of strides for positive um, change since 2007. So I'm glad that you're here because you can kind of see and maybe even say a little bit about like what it was when you were there. What did you experience when you were in the uh, It was military. 2017. 
Oh, 2017. Yeah. So even 2017. So a lot again has changed. And just you being able. So you were in 2017. We were not. Um, we had the restricted and unrestricted reporting. But again, it was more so like I explained. If someone is in the hallway and they hear it, and leadership hears it, and someone has reported. Um, and so now the reporting, um, who can report and who cannot report, has also uh, changed. Yeah, I'm a vet also, and I got out in 88, and so it's like, wow. Um, when I was in, you were, it was just starting, mm -hmm. um, and it was, um, yeah, I'm kind of reflecting on some of my experiences, and I pretty much got out a little earlier because it mm -hmm. was not defined. During that time, when they said, um, are you being sexually harassed and stuff like that? We didn't know. We thought it was touching. We didn't know it included a lot of this stuff. So, um, yeah, this is very interesting, and I'm glad um, it has actually um, advanced. You know, I just wish it was differently. You know, maybe my experience would have been different. I know my experience would have been different. Definitely so. Anybody else? Um, next, you can go to the next slide. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. And so then the so then we have like we go to the legal proceedings, right? So if there's evidence that supports the allegation, um, then the proceedings will follow, and the case will be presented to the court martial or the legal um, equivalent. And I'll go into the victims' rights um, a little bit later. But there has been a lot of changes because um, victims can now we make them more involved in the process, right? Because before um, they might have not been involved in the process, but now they can even choose if they want to have um, the civilian sector take their case or if they want to have it handled in the in the military. So um, they do have a lot more choices. As a victim, you have more choices um, of how you want your case to be handled. You have a lot more rights than you did in 2017, 2007, 1990s. Like there's a lot significant improvement we still have a ways to go I feel but we do have there has definitely been some significant strides in the right direction and then confidentiality okay so they're also victim advocacy so they also are assigned a victim advocate so every person person who um, reports a sexual assault is a, assigned a victim advocate and that person will go with them um, to their appointments um, help them to you know get with the victims um, counsel to, just to help them kind of walk through that process uh, just to, as an additional support because again when we're talking about sexual assault it can be lonely it can be um you can't feel isolated uh, so this process is designed to have them have someone with them because it, it can be difficult and it is very scary it's a very scary process and daunting it's a very long and daunting process as well and then confidentiality military personnel involved are expected to maintain confidentiality so that is another key thing because previously when we talked about sexual assault in the military confidentiality was very um everybody kind of like knew it was kind of like if there was a sexual assault in your unit everybody was talking about it everybody knew um there was no respect for confidentiality it's kind of like if it went to the leadership um or if somebody else found out in the unit and some you know people were talking about it then they kind of um escalated and then everyone knew and every unit know, knows about it so they're doing much better um with protecting you know confidentiality and need to know we share only what needs to know with the commander even when it's a um, unrestricted report it's a really need to know. We don't share anything that the commander does not need to know. Next slide. And these are some barriers to reporting. Um, I'm not going to go over each one of these, uh, but this is why, again, we talked about fear of, retali fear of retaliation. That's a big one. Um, lack of trust in the system. So many individuals do not report because they don't trust the system. Is this report going to go anywhere? So let's say I go to my leadership and I report that I have been sexually assaulted. Or I tell my supervisor and then my supervisor asks me, well, are you sure that you were sexually assaulted? Maybe you misinterpreted what was going on. You know, I know, you know, San Diego, she's a really good girl. Or I know, you know, Ross and he's a great guy. So he would not, he wouldn't do anything like that. So then they downplay um, the incident and have you second guessing, like, did this happen to me or did this not happen to me? So they don't trust that the report is going to go anywhere. Like, I tell my supervisor, but is he going to do anything with it? And then again, the stigma um, and shame, just cultural norms, 
Um, they, like I said, they discourage you from some, you know, because they question you, like, were you sure? What were you doing? How late were you out? Why, why were you with them at two o'clock in the morning? Why are you, why, why are you at the bar drinking by yourself? Why didn't you take your friends with you? So you hear all of those things when you're going forward to report a sexual assault. And then again, we talk about that chain of that chain of command dynamics. If my superior is one of the people who was involved in the sexual assault, how likely am I to go and report that to someone else? Um, and then like we said before, that, that reporting process can be complicated, right? Because once you report and you decide that you want to do the unrestricted report, everybody's in your business. It's like, everybody's in my business. I'm getting all these questions. I'm being interviewed. I'm asking if I'm sure. Are you positive? Like I said, so then you start to second guess. So the, the process can be daunting. I had an individual who was, um, she filed a sexual assault and then she was thinking about maybe wanting to change her mind because she wanted to do what we have now. I'm going to go into what we call the expedited transfer. And so if you've been sexually assaulted um, and you're in the person for your safety, we will PCS you to another location or another base. But in that process, um, because there was a child involved also in the incident, you know, then we had to notify CPS because, you know, Child Protective Services, we're also a mandated reporter. And so CPS has to come out to her house and they have to interview her. And so that process of now CPS is coming to my house and I'm the victim. Like, why is, you know, Child Protective Service interviewing me and saying they need to, you know, look at my refrigerator and they got to call this person. They have to do this. Um, so then she was really wanting to not, she wanted to take back the report, not participate in the report because of the, the process. Like I said, it can be overwhelming. Next slide. Ask, can I ask a question on that slide, yes. if you don't mind? Yes, I'm looking yes. at the last one, the impact on careers. And I'm kind of reflecting on how I got out. Um, like I said, I, I was in the service in 82 and I got out in 88 because of sexual harassment. And it wasn't defined the way it's defined now. I was a young person. So I thought, nope, they didn't touch me. I didn't think about all those other um, um, sly stuff, comments and things like that. Well, mm -hmm. anyway, to, to, to wrap it all up, um, I kind of looked at, looked through the um, regs and stuff like that. And I did have, I was a single parent at that time. And I had a child. And so I actually got out under parenthood, um, just trying to get out because no one would. I didn't know I was being sexually harassed. I thought I was, but I could not define it. My one company commander, um, I was te a temporary assigned somewhere else um, for 90 days. And so I would go back to my one company commander who I trust. And he was he was trying to help me through the process. Um, and then it got to the point where he had to step out for his career because they started, um, they said some really nasty things like um, she has your, your nose wide open. And, you know, I kind of remember all this, this things that was said, and I'm kind of reflecting back on when I was in the service. So I kind of stepped away to try to um, um, limit the, 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 I guess the pressure that he was um, feeling. And another lady, another, um, I was in the Navy and a, another lady pulled me aside and said, look under regs because she knew I was a single parent. And so as I was, I was searching and everything, and I found this one clause that actually at the, at that time I was in, uh, women weren't um, assigned combat. And I was actually stationed in Hawaii and Hawaii was considered my sea duty at the particular, at that time. So I kind of use that as an out to get out up under parenthood because technically it was my sea duty, but it was also, it was a, it was land based. Mm -hmm. um, what I, I think my question, I, I gave you the background information because I'm thinking about, they messed up my reenlistment code. So I have an honorable discharge with the RE code of, I think it's a four, that negative code. And when I was going through the whole experience, they were like, well, you can never get in the reserves. You can never um, be a civilian and apply on, on the for a job on a base and everything. Since I have that huh, on my DD-214, how can I... I mean, because now we're embracing and we know so much more about sexual harassment and sexual um, assault and sexual trauma. How is there a way to reverse that? Or is am I kind of tainted from ever getting a job on the base? Because I've always wanted to kind of work on the base as a social worker. But that's in the back of my mind because I do have that 
that that reenlistment code, but I have an honorable discharge. And usually when you see a, 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 a reenlistment code of a four, you're talking about somebody with a dishonorable discharge. Mm -hmm. You can have that um, changed and relooked at. Um, you are Navy? Yes. Okay. So I'm not familiar with the Navy's um, protocol, but I know that if you was to call the SARC's office at the Navy, um, they will be able to direct you in the right place, or even if you call it the legal office in the Navy, because they, they have made significant changes and they have reversed, we have seen them reverse codes, because again, like you said, the things have changed, um, processes have changed, we've even um, separated individuals because of certain things, and then we have allowed them to come back in just because regulations have changed. Oh, okay. Well, I'm old now, but <laughs> well, no, I know you're not going to want to come back in. But again, I'm just saying to change the yeah, the I know what you're change. saying. Yeah, yeah, because it that has always it's been a stumbling block, and it's like I don't it doesn't make sense for the education I have and the work experience I have, but yet and still I can't work with the population that I would want to work with, and it's because of that reenlistment code. Yes, they can update that. All righty. Well, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Anybody else have any questions though? And then this is just an overall general view of what we see um, for women, like um, why they don't report. And so this is just kind of a uh, fear of retaliation. Re retaliation, you're going to hear me say a lot of times because that is what we hear a lot of, right? Um, concerns about it not being confidential, um, concerns that nothing's going to be done about it, or they see the neg negative experience that someone else has had. And so that deters them from reporting. They just feel uncomfortable about making the report, concerned about being labeled. Again, because we go back to this military camaraderie, we're a family. Um, now I'm saying that this family member, this person who was close to me or whatever hurt me in some kind of way. How do I deal, how do I deal with that? And so now they're going to be like, you're a troublemaker. You did this. You were here. You you did those things. So um, I, I was just going to say, I'm sorry. Go Can ahead. you hear me? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. I was just going to say, I do have a friend. Um, she's still in for one. She's active um, and she's been sexually assaulted. But when I say it was years ago, it was years ago. And her biggest thing was the length of time she has had to put in to get justice. She's still going through legal action with the military and the civilian world. Uh, it's going, but it's, I think for her, um, the way she described it was the drawn out process of the military itself, a lot of investigation, a lot of redundancy, a lot of constantly having to relive. It's re-traumatizing for her. And it seems a lot longer than the civilian side because you have to do both. Correct. Yeah. So like I said, it is a long process and it can be discouraging, right? And like you said, you deal with someone, you have, may have an um, office of a special, special investigation, they may interview you. And then someone else from that same office may come back and interview you. And then they were trying to get the alleged offender um, to be interviewed. And then his lawyer team is telling him not to, you know, talk to anyone. And so it, it, it does become a very long and daunting uh, process. And through that process, sometimes people just kind of give up. Um, so you're right. It is, a, it is a long process. And they are working on it. They're working on it. Um, and again, it depends on, they're taking a lot of the, um, decision making out of the commander's hands because a lot of times it was slowed up because of leadership right like the commander or the officer in charge may be saying like well I know sergeant so and so and she's this or she's a good person or he's a good like no he wouldn't do anything like that or she wouldn't do anything like this and so they kind of slow the process up right and before the command had a lot more authority um, than they do now so the command does not make decisions anymore about if this person is going to get punished or if we are going to um, move forward with an investigation. That has been taken out of the commander's uh, hand in the military, at least in DOD portion. Next slide. And this is what we hear for men and why they don't report, okay? Um, the number one thing, really, a lot of men do not report because of the fear of is someone really going to believe me? Because the, stere the stereotype, right, is that men are strong, military, you know, they can defend themselves. Can a woman really um, rape a man? And so they really kind of feel like no one is going to believe me. Or when I go to report that, the person that I'm reporting it to is in this shock and awe. Does this really happen to you? Um, 
again, concerns about security clearances and in the military, most people in the military are concerned about um, a security clearance and losing their security clearance because if they lose their security clearance, then they can't do their job or they have to um, cross train to do something else. So even when we talk about mental health and I see people on a mental health, um, for mental health issues or concerns, the main thing they want to know is, am I going to use my security clearance? Well, back in the day, we did, you know, if you had any kind of mental health issues or concerns, we was, you know, taking your security clearance. We were separating you from the military. Now, not so much. Um, if it's not severe, severe mental health issues where you cannot perform the duties of the military, we are not separating people just on um, mental health issues alone. And of course, we're not separating people based on or taking their security clearance based on a, a sexual assault. Any questions about that? Anything else? Okay, next slide. And then this is where we go and we talk about that. Now we have a lot more rights as victims and protections, all right? Um, so the main thing here that I just really want to point on is that we they have the right to maintain a degree of the privilege they have. They are protected from the offender, the alleged offender. So what I talk about um, there is that when I talked about they are allowed to move to another base, another location, um, another part of the base, um, that is new because before we didn't offer the expedited transfer. Uh, so that's a, a great thing that allows victims to get away from the environment. Maybe you can get them close to their family, their support system. So that is an option that they now have. They're um, made to be able to pursue to be heard in proceedings, whereas before sometimes the victim was not even allowed to, to speak or testify in the court hearing. So now they are allowing them to do that. Um, let's see. And they can choose to, if they want to have, uh, if they want their court case to be heard in the civilian law sector or if they want it to be done through the military channels. Next slide. Knowledge check. In the chat, is it A, B, C, or D? Who can maintain some degree of privileged communications with a victim about an assault? Yes, D, that is correct. Staffer personnel, which is the suicide, um, suicide, sexual assault prevention and response personnel, um, medical personnel to include mental health professionals, the chaplain corps, and then the victim's council, which is the legal team for uh, sexual assault. All right, next slide. All right, so now we talk about um, military context, sexual assault as it relates to military. All right, next slide. All right, so we know that the military culture, right, we talked about this, um, may compound feelings of helplessness, isolation, and betrayal. And so I talked about how in the military, we have this system of like loyalty, right? And teamwork. And now I have experienced this sexual assault. So what happens to my inner self that I, now I have this experience where I have this chain um, of command and I cannot believe that this happened to me. So I'm in more like shock that this has happened. Um, and then it's just very taboo. So now out of loyalty for my team and my members, I don't report this because I can't talk. I can't talk negative about my peers because so and so. Everyone talks about how great this airman is or this soldier. This is a great person. There's no way that he would do something like this. Um, and so then you are torn between: Do I report this? And you're more concerned about this person and this loyalty and the commitment that you have to the military and this code of ethics that we have, right? In the military, you know this integrity and all these things that we talk about. But at the same time. Um, this happened to me and I don't I don't know how to handle that or deal with it, right? And then we also deal with the whole, you know, strength. The military is taught, you know, that we are strong. Um, we don't let anything, you know, get in our way. We're self-sufficient. So now as a victim, I don't want to identify myself as a victim because then what does that mean? That means that now I'm seen as weak or that I couldn't take care of myself or um, same thing for men, right? That stigma with men. Men is a, it's even more so a stigma with men because we are normal society norms for men is that, you know, they're strong. Um, they can take care of themselves. It's cool to, you know, get all the women, right? So now men also struggle with um, issues of 
and I'm, I'm not gonna rush myself okay and then it reduces your social support so what does that look like if I have this team you know in my unit and now I report this sexual assault so now I start to get ostracized people are not talking to me maybe there is some retaliation so now I'm like isolated over here by myself does that make sense? Anybody have anything to add? All right, next slide. Y'all are a quiet group. Of, I'm just gonna have to start calling on people. <laughs> okay, and then construct. Now, this is what we are power differential, right? We talked about this power struggle in the military, and it's good, right? I feel like, but at the same time, it's not because you have, like, again, officer enlisted, you have that power instructor. And officers are, you know, 01 to, you know, 07, 06, you know, general, okay? And then you have um, the enlisted, which is um, E1 to E9. So that's your enlisted population. Um, so they come together, right? And they're in, this mil in the military. And there is this, it is a form of discrimination, if you will, because it's like, if you're an officer, then you're here. And if you're enlisted, then you're here. Um, and so that power dynamic, if I have someone who is an officer and they sexually assaulted me, what do I do with that? Or even if I have someone who is a higher enlisted personnel and I'm at a lower enlisted and I'm being sexually assaulted, what do I do with that? Like this person isn't controlling me. We are taught like from basic training, like on day one of basic training, you are to respect the orders and the people above you, right? You, you sign on the diet line, you take this oath. And so something like this happens, what do I do with that? And so... You don't deal with that in the civilian sector. You don't have to necessarily worry about um, when we talk about like confidentiality in the civilian sector or if, do I have to tell my boss in the civilian sector? I don't have to tell my boss if I was sexually assaulted, right? Um, I can do things and then have a investigation and I have to worry about some of the things that we have to, you know, cope with or deal with in the, in the military sector. But again, that power differential is very, it's a very complicated process and it creates a lot of fear and anxiety and it does stop and it creates that barrier for reporting. Next slide. And then this is just the nature of military assaults. Okay, so again, the perpetrator is often known. Most of the time in sexual assaults in the military, we know the person. We either work with them, um, they're our supervisor, uh, they may be in another unit, but we do functions with them. So typically, we we know who this person is, and again, we work and live in uh, close proximity to them, and it can be repeated. So again, with military personnel, the sexual assault it may be more than one time. It could happen numerous times, um, and I'm sure you've seen on the news um, where the commanders were sleeping with multiple, you know, women in their units, right? Um, for a long for a period of for years that this had been happening. Um, and then again, it depends also, the environment also carries weight, like where this happened also impacts how I'm going to respond or if I'm going to report. If I'm in a deployed location, which is, I'm in Afga Afghanistan or Iraq, Turkey, where there is limited support system, I don't have my support network and it's a very small unit, that's going to also determine if I'm going to report or if I'm just going to, you know, suck it up and keep it moving. Um, so yeah. So the environment that it occurs is also very important because then let's say it did happen when you were in Iraq or Afghanistan and then you report it. The good thing is now when you go to Iraq or you deploy, we do have a sexual assault uh, advocate there and you have a SART. So they are now at your deployed locations um, for you. But you don't want to risk, some people don't want to risk that if I report the sexual assault, then I have to return home. I have to leave um, the deployment early all these things go through your mind. Next slide. And then there, here's just some statistics um, and just the uniqueness of military sexual assault versus the civilian sector. Like I said, it may be ongoing, um, which means they may be assaulted. There's a, a blurred boundaries between the work and your personal, because now it's kind of like, this is my personal life, but then this is work. And where does it and it's now it's starting to blend together because I can't stay, separate them because of this event that has happened to me. Oftentimes there's a, a presence of weapons that are involved and there's often, you know, physical threat. If you tell somebody I'm going to hurt you, I'm going to do this. Um, and you end up seeing this person, the perpetrator, you often see them because again, they work with you or they're somewhere near your location. You may be attending meetings with them. Um, you may have to go on a, a temporary duty assignment with them. So you see these people. And then 60% of the perpetrators are leaders. leaders. 
um, and they're in leadership positions and they're over you. Again, that fear of retaliation, we saw that 62% uh, of individuals who reported their sexual assault reported that they had experienced some form of retali retaliation or ostracism. And then just this lack of uh, leadership support. So statistically speaking here, only about 20% of the cases are prosecuted and only 9% are convicted. So it's still a very low rate of conviction um, for military sexual assault. Any questions about any of that? All right, next slide. And then these are just some of the legal consequences um, that I just want to put out there to show that the military is working um, to make sure that we do, um, that we show that there is a zero tolerance for sexual assault and sexual harassment in the military. And so um, you can lose your rank. Um, you can get removed from your leadership position. Uh, you saw the thing in uh, Fort Hood where all of those commanders and all those people in leadership positions were removed. They all got fired right after the investigation took place, um, which back in back in even 20, what, 2000, the 80s and 90s, that was not happening, okay? Um, so the fact that now they are actually holding leadership and leaders and those who um, commit acts of sexual assault accountable. There's, again, disciplinary action, reduction in pay. Reduction in pay, um, some individuals may even experience confinement or restriction to the base, which means that they cannot leave the base. They have to stay there on the base, and they're not authorized to leave. Um, and then, again, the criminal hearings, we're going to talk about the UCMJ, um, which is the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Um, you can also have the, if the case hot, depending on the severity of the sexual assault, um, it can go to court martial. And then there's also imprisonment. Um, so they can spend time in prison um, for a sexual assault. And we have had issues where people have gone to prison for sexual assault. And then discharge, you get a dishonorable discharge from the military, which also impacts you for the rest of your life. Um, if you've been discharged, dishonorably discharged from the military, it does have significant impact on your career. I see a question in the chat. What was it? Um, do you perceive that rape culture is so a part of the military that some of the areas you identify is missed and overlooked? Most definitely. Um, because of that rape culture and these rape myths um, that are perceived that yes, people, they don't, they, there's this rape fallacy, right? And people do not, um, they don't acknowledge that this sexual assault because of the culture of the military, going back to the whole, the camaraderie, the loyalty. Um, we are men and that's what men do. We're, we're a male dominated uh, population or organization. And so some of this is, well, that's what men do, right? It's like, it's okay. Um, and again, I'm saying men because um, this is a male dominated group of uh, organization. And so we do see more males um, who are uh, the perpetrators of sexual assault than we do females. Did I answer your question, Shannon? I'm assuming I did. Yes, it did. I apologize. I was responding to something that oh. you stated. Uh, what I was saying was um, that in regards to that, for me, because I'm a Navy vet, I separated in 2009 with an honorable discharge, but we were so used to, uh, you know, this type of language, type of conduct, that it was okay. And I put an example, you know, we were told that Navy, female Navy sailors were basically mattresses for our kind of parts. So, mm -hmm. and nobody took that as, they just kind of was like, it was just not normal, common speech and nobody was expected to be offended or along by that. Right. Yes. Um, there was a, a case in 1990, 1991, like the tailgate, um, we're in um, what was it? Vegas. So in Vegas, the Vegas Hotel, um, the Gatlet. So they would have the individuals, they would have women walk down this runway um, and they would like whistle at them and be like, she's a five, she's a six. Okay, let's go over here and have sex over here. Like it was a whole thing, like a whole, um, and they did this for years um, back in 1991. So again, that culture of we're flyer, flyers, like people who are 
special operations or their flyers, the pilots were in the military. You like it's known that hey, I'm a pilot. Don't you want to you want to get with me? Like everybody wants to get with me because I'm a pilot, and so they just kind of take it upon themselves um, to engage in sexual activities or inappropriate behavior um, because of their career field. Because that's what everybody wants me is their mentality, right? So yes, that is a very true. Thank you for sharing your experience. Next slide. You use that? Oops, I got out of my bed. Now we're going to talk about, uh, again, sexual trauma and the factors and uh, risk factors and PTSD. And then here's just um, some interesting information that I found about uh, trauma, um, history of trauma. If you have a history of trauma, um, childhood trauma, you're more likely to experience a uh, sexual assault or physical re-victimization as an adult. Um, that research showed that 16 to 72% of females um, who had a childhood sexual uh, experience were victims of childhood sexual experience also um, were more likely to experience physical and sexual assault. Um, are you guys all familiar with the adverse childhood experiences, ACEs? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and so we know that through that through that study, they also found that, especially for the military, those who um, were victims or had more ACEs, three or more ACEs, were more likely to experience um, sexual assault um, or unwanted sexual contact um, in the military, right? So that's just some, um, there's not, like, again, there's not a whole lot of research for men, but it's getting better, but it's not a lot. Next slide. And so here, childhood trauma is known to be a risk factor for sexual assault. And this is, we found that 30% of all active duty women and 6% 6 of all active duty men um, report sexual assault prior to joining the military. And then here's the thing, military men and women with three or more ACEs were more vulnerable to unsolicited sexual attention and sexual contact. And this one was interesting too, given the history of um, child sexual trauma, the risk of sexual victimization was twice as high and possibly 10 times higher than those with a history of, without a history of childhood sexual abuse. So again, that's one of the um, risk factors is if you had a history of trauma growing up or prior to, you're more likely to maybe might experience um, a sexual assault. You also know that um, a large percent of military members, I did some research um, for my dissertation and found that um, probably more than 90% of military members have some prior um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, and they have high ACE scores. And so really trying to hone in on um, the ACE scores and how that relates to depression, anxiety, PTSD, and helping military service members to understand how their previous trauma and childhood trauma impacts their 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 life, right? Because a lot of times with the military, we don't look at childhood trauma or childhood um, adversities. We just deal with the the presenting problem that you present right here with me. You have been sexually assaulted, so I'm not gonna. You are depressed, so I'm, I don't really dig deep into your childhood. I just want to take care of your depression like right now, um, not knowing that if I talk about these ACEs, um, it can help you to understand your experiences and why you behave the way you behave and why you respond the way you respond. Next slide. And these are just some common risk factors that we have found um, DOD-wide, right? So if you're in the age between 17 and 24, you're at greater risk um, for sexual assault. Females, it typically is a lower rank. You either E1 to E4, um, unmarried, new to the military, so it's still more so if you're new to the military, regardless of age, but if you're just new. Um, if you've had exposure to community community crime and violence, again, your socioeconomic status also plays a, a, a factor. And then if you were exposed to communities with social norms that is that were supportive of sexual assault, like the military, like um, before now, right? The military, it was it was social norms. Like she talked about the mattress, it was this normal normal behavior for you to touch someone, or grope them, or be like, "Hey, you look good today," or "Hey, you need a ride? Let me, I can show you how to ride." Like, and they was just sending 
you know, in the windows that were inappropriate, but that's just, we all just kind of accepted that as that was just kind of the way it is in the military. Men will be men and they're going to say what they're going to say. Um, and so that's kind of, it has, it became very normal. And so now trying to undo something that was going on for 70 some years is it, taking some time, but it is, it is changing for the better. Next slide. Any questions about the risk factors? Okay. And then these are just some characteristics that we see uh, for perpetrators. Um, lack of concern for others, I think is again, hyper-masculine attitude. Like I said earlier, like I'm a man, this is what men do. Um, they take advantage of uh, permissive environments where leaders are dismissing the behavior. So if the leadership does not confront the behavior and it, it starts like there's this continuum, right, of harm. And so it may start off with small things like um, saying something or maybe I have a picture, maybe I have some jokes. Maybe I am, I have some jokes about sexual assault or I have some jokes about women or jokes about men. And then it starts to escalate from now no longer it's a joke. So now I'm, you know, my leadership didn't say anything about the joke. So now I may start with some, you know, like touching, um, like, you know, you're in a hallway, like I said earlier, and I may just decide to rub your shoulder. And then if from that, it goes to the, oh, you want to go out for a date? You know, and you're like, no, I don't want to go out. Like, oh, and they constantly are continuing to ask you, you want to go out to date? Or they're making comments about your appearance, or they're making comments about your, your body, um, you know, how you chew your food, just different things like that in a sexual nature. Right. So if that continues to go on on that continuum, then eventually it leads to full blown like sexual assault. And if no one corrects those things when they see them, then that's why we have sexual assault. So we do have um, we're doing an excellent job with, you know, bystander teaching, bystander training, um, delegating. If you don't feel comfortable, you know, delegating it to someone else, um, confronting the individual. So we are doing better with trying to teach our service members. Um, that this is unacceptable. And if you see it, say something. Do not, do not be quiet. Next slide. And then again, this is just another factor to consider is that interpersonal trauma, again, goes back to this is a human being that did this to me. And this is someone that often is a friend or intimate partner, someone that I know. Um, and it violates, you know, boundaries, personal integrity, because again, we're built on, the military is built on integrity, right? Service before self. So sometimes that service before self prevents people from reporting sexual assault. And then again, it disrupts that, that uh, person's sense of safety, trust, and connection with others. Because again, this happened to me. This is someone who was close to me, who I respected, who I looked up to, who I wanted to be this, you know, chief, um, when, when I grow up, right, or I wanted to be this officer, and now this officer has done something to me because I was, you know, vulnerable, right, um, and then it sends this message about what relationships involve, so now I'm confused about, like, what does the relationship involve, how does it involve in the military, like, what does this mean for me, um, this was somebody I trusted, and so now, again, I'm going back to question myself, and what did I do wrong, was something wrong with me, is this expected behavior, like, is this the norm, because again, we talk about social norms and if it becomes normal, then it's just expected. And so then we don't say anything because no one else is saying anything. They just did it to Jennifer and it just happened to Tommy and no one said anything about it. So it, I guess that's just what we do, right? Um, and then it has significant implications for victims later, for victims later relationships and understanding stuff. So I kind of already talked about that. But depending on your past history of trauma and your age, it can also impact how you move forward because again like I said earlier sexual assault does have long lasting impact um and it may be years and years and years um before you really have a complete healing or that healing process can take place but with lots of support um it can't happen right because we know that you don't have to relive your trauma anymore right research shows that we don't have to relive the trauma I don't have to talk about it I just have to understand how this experience is impacting how I view the world, what I think about myself, um, how I respond to people, how I behave. Okay, next slide. All right, and this is just me showing you guys. Um, these are the combat, right? So 
lots of people when they think about the military be like combat everybody in the military they got combat they have ptsd um and then this is interpersonal violence and just look at the thing they're exactly the same for the most part right um the risk factors for combat ptsd and the risk factors for interpersonal violence um ptsd is the same so I just thought that that was interesting when you actually do the research and you look and see that there is no difference. So um, me experiencing a combat is not going to make me higher risk for PTSD and vice versa. Questions about that? All right, next slide. So now we're gonna move into clinical presentation. Um, and I'm glad because I have a lot of clinicians in here, right? So it's good to, and if you've seen, you may see military, how many people you are treating military members or um, work with military in a military environment where you may see um, veterans or active duty members in your jobs? So we're on a clinical presentation. Um, and this is just going to, we're going to really just talk about how a, a member or individual may present um, who has uh, been sexually assaulted, right? Or a victim of sexual assault and their common symptoms and problems. Uh, next slide. And so this is what we, um, you may see. So they may, you may see extreme um, emotions. Um, there may be some, so, you know, you may see someone who's, you know, extremely, you know, depressed, but at the same time, you may see them where well, they have some extreme anxiety. Um, they may have difficulties in a hierarchical environment because, um, the situation where the rank structure and and that difficulty with rank, right? So they don't they don't want to deal with individuals where um, there's a a rank structure. So a lot of times you will see individuals who would prefer to um, go off base uh, to receive treatment or even to um, report their case or to if they're going to do a unrestricted report, they want to have the situation taken care of off base just because of the um, environment of the rank in that structure, right? You'll see some emotional disengagement, you know, flatness, again, just maybe not having any kind of emotion, um, difficulties with concentration, as we talked about, attention, uh, sleep, um, again, re-experiencing the trauma. They may have strong reactions to reminders. If your situation happened in an employee setting, um, when you come back home, there may be certain smells that remind you of, of the assault. There may be certain people that remind you, or maybe even a certain food if it happened, if it, let's say it happened, you know, after hours outside of the BFAC. And so now whenever you're in a cafeteria environment, or maybe you go to like a Luby's, do y'all have Luby's? Or if you have like a Luby's or any type of cafeteria, you um, start to experience uh, reminders of that or, or, or smells that remind you. Again, you're more hypervigilant due to that. And then again, we talked about earlier the suicide um, thoughts and behaviors, uh, self-harm. You'll see that more so frequently, more frequently now in sexual assault uh, cases. Next slide. So then here, um, we talked about, you will see, you're going to see um, difficulties with the core um, areas of functioning and well-being. So again, we talked about some of these things earlier, like interpersonal relationships, the difficulty um, in relationships, you may start to avoid relationships. You don't want to be in a relationship. Um, you may even have starts to impact your personal life. Again, because we talked about there's long lasting impact of sexual assault. So not only did this thing happen to me on my duty location at work, but now I'm starting to see its impact, you know, in my relationships with my husband, my spouse, uh, my girlfriends, um, with my kids. That, you know, maybe I'm a little bit more isolated, withdrawn from my kids, or maybe I'm not able to um, give them that attention and uh, affection that they need because of this uh, sexual assault experience. And then the difficult with identity, like we talked about earlier, that sense of self, like where do I belong now in this spectrum, this place that I held up, um, this institution that I held this high, now this has happened to me. So we talk about that institutional betrayal and that betrayal trauma that comes along with that. And then again, your, your spiritual spirituality, you start to question your spirituality, maybe you start to question your faith. So this is some of the things that you may see. Next slide.
Okay, what did you guys think about that? Um, comments? Feedback? For, for me, I was greatly thankful for that video because there are a lot of men that were in the military, you know, veterans and currently active that have experienced sexual trauma prior to and during the enlistment and after enlistment and you don't really get to hear their voices so i really appreciate that a lot a lot of my clients that were part of the military would share that and they would have a lot of discomfort when we work through this stuff so I, I appreciate you sharing that video. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for your vulnerability. So I'm going to say, I'm going to be honest. I automatically assumed every last one of those stories was a woman because <laughs> it, it sounds very gender neutral. Um, but even though it says, yeah, this is what we're, we're going to talk about male service members and veterans, but then here they popped out and I was like, wow. Um, and how long did it take for anybody to notice? They didn't notice. So no one else probably noticed. Um, and then they went into this super macho culture that required them to continue to kind of bury it. So even if they had, I think about as a previous service member, any of their disciplinary um, uh, disciplinary actions or um, any infractions on their service record, may also go back to those assaults because I think some of them said that you know it was in childhood this is the first time it happened six but when you think about behaviors throughout the life cycle and then becoming an adult in a in a culture that does not allow you to heal it just screams out some more um I just I, I recognize my own bias so it's just like oh these are women no mm -hmm. I feel the same way because I was like, and even they were saying, she's like, I just want to hug her. And I was like, I want to hug her too. And then when the men came out, I was like, oh, that shows us how like we're subconsciously biased at some things, but at least we acknowledge it. Yes. And that's why I showed it because it is, you hear, you see that and then you think, oh, these are women. And then these men come out and you are like, wow, because we do all have biases. And that's what the, the important thing is to check those check our biases because they do impact how we respond and how we treat um, victims of sexual assault. Because if I have a bias about, you know, women versus men, then when a man comes into my office and says that he's been sexually assaulted and I don't believe that men can really be sexual assaulted, it's going to show. And I'm going to um, treat that individual in therapy as if I, I don't believe them or, you know, the story is maybe not true or so. Yeah. So really trying to show you that this does happen to me and um, of all genders, all races. Um, so that's kind of like the, the point, like you said, to check your check our biases at the door and to acknowledge them and being upfront and saying, yes, this is a bias. This is something I'm struggling with and I'm going to you know be working on it. Right. Because we all have them. We all have biases. All right. Um, and so, like we said, like we, this video show every man um, has a unique, a unique story. Um, and so it's just important for us to be able to um, understand uh, the male's perspective and understand that this does happen to, to men. And men and boys are taught, as you saw in the video, to be strong, uh, to be tough. So it makes it even more complicated um, when you grow up in a family like that, or you're taught that these social norms, so now I cannot cry, I can't be vulnerable, Etc. Next slide. And before you move on, I just had a quick question that also makes me wonder: like, has there ever been any studies in the military? Because I know they they took away the "don't ask, don't tell" uh, a couple years ago. Um, do they ever do any studies on like the gender fluidity in the military and how many sexual uh, traumas occur to like gender fluid individuals? We have not, and you know, because again, that is kind of like new, you know, military, you know, we will do some research, but it would take, you know, 20 years for us to publish the research. But um, so no, there has not been any now, but um, there has not been any currently that I have seen that's related to military populations. But however, I'm sure that it is coming because um, again, we're making lots of changes um, with gender neutral, um, and those that population right so I think that we will start to see more research in that area 
because we're seeing it in the military. And these are just some common uh, male myths, okay, that these are all false, just because it's a myth, so you know it's false, right? But um, so again, in, in even in the military, you know, we had somebody, to, she just brought it, but we had the don't ask, don't tell. You guys are familiar with uh, don't ask, don't tell. So um, it was, if you were um, gay or lesbian in the military and you were serving, you could not tell. So if someone asked you, that was a don't ask, don't tell, because if you did tell, um, or disclose that you were gay or lesbian in the military, then you were discharged. And as a mental health provider, I was a mandated reporter. So if someone came to me and said that they were, I a mandated to report that to leadership and then they would proceed um, with separation for those service members. But we don't no longer have don't ask, don't tell. But that's just an example of, so if a man was raped in that, in that era of don't ask, don't tell, then it impacted if they were going to tell because then they were afraid that they were going to be seen as gay, right? Or homosexual. And then they would se they would be separated from the from the military. So a lot of times in that era, men did not definitely did not report because they didn't want to be separated or seen as um gay or lesbian. You know, does that make sense? Definitely. Okay. I won't say um I won't disclose names or anything, but I do know several. Uh, retired, separated individuals that say they see a lot more of this happening overseas. I'm Navy. I didn't say that earlier. I'm Navy. So um, I had someone tell me that they see male on male sexual assault more so overseas and by rain in that area because there are areas where their families can't go. And there's not that many women in those areas either that they have access to. So there's a lot of assault happening to uh I guess, satisfy needs or impulses. That may be true. Now, I have not seen any um, research on that, but I, know, I do know that there are more um, sexual assaults that do occur in deployed settings. Again, because like you said, mentioned the environment is, is smaller environment. Um, you're Navy. So depending on if they deploy like if there's the population of women versus men, you know, that also impacts um, the, the reporting or what does happen. So that could very well be true. And then we have a uh, real man can't, can't defend this up. This list goes back to the whole stereotype of, you know, if I'm a man, I should be able to defend myself. If this happens to me, then am I not a real man? And then you start to kind of question your sexuality, um, your manhood, et cetera. Um, next slide. And then we just talked about like how the media portrays um, male characteristics. So they portray those things as positive, like this whole self-control, being able to control others, um, aggression, violence, financial uh, independence, physical desirability, all of those things are considered positive traits in social media. So um, so these pressures can influence how men respond to um, a sexual assault, right? And so it says here that 10% of men in the country have, been, um, have suffered some form of sexual assault. Uh, male victims are more likely than female victims to report that they had multiple, if there were more, multiple perpetrators, or men also view um, it as hazing, right? And so they will, they rarely say that they were sexually assaulted, or they may just say they were assaulted, but they don't use sexual, or they see it as a hazing. Because again, in the military, there was lots of hazing. There probably is still a great amount of hazing that goes on in the military, and so they don't ever use the term, or will not use the term sexual assault, but they'll say that they were um, hazed. Um, and depending on your career field in the military, you may see it more so more so than in other career fields. And then that um, the uh, National um, Center for Post Traumatic Stress Disorder reports that again, ten percent of the men have suffered from a traumatic response. And then males are expected to protect themselves, um, especially military men. So again, that goes back to um, if you didn't stop it, then that means that you wanted it, right? So they have that battle that they have to that they have to face too. And then again it goes back to that self-blame. Um and then they start to feel like they're not like a real man, like I said earlier. And then that homosexual vibe, like is there something you know wrong with me? And again, some
some military members are still, even though don't ask, don't tell does not exist. Um, there are some old school people that's still in the military, right? Um, and they still have their personal views um, that interferes with how they uh, do their job. Again, this was just shown to just really to reiterate that sexual assault happens in the military. Sexual assault happens to men. Um, and these men, their experiences with the outcome or the treatment, um, the referral process, it went as if it was like it was supposed to go. Um, the leadership did what they were supposed to do. Um, so I just wanted to kind of show that. And then here's some concerns that if you're treating male um, service members or veterans, these are the clinical concerns that, clinical concerns that you may um, see. There may be concerns about re you know, reporting or documenting in their medical record, again, for fear of um, repercussions, separation, loss of security clearance, so they don't, don't want to see documenting in their medical record. Because again, also privacy, confidentiality, who's going to read that? Not only um, the medical, not medical personnel are not the only individuals that have access to their record or um, someone that I know may read that who works in medical, right? They have, may experience higher rates of depression. They may avoid um, group treatment because especially when it has to do with um, combat, right? Because their experience of PTSD is not the same as someone with combat. So they feel um, less than or inferior to now going and talk about uh, uh, sexual assault treatment um, or PTSD treatment for sexual assault when I have this person over here who killed, you know, three or four people. So they have difficulty with that, being in a group with someone in uh, combat and the fear of being judged by the, by the provider. That, oh, oh my God, ah. or again, our personal biases get in the way and we may ask questions that appear to be judgmental, right? Um, and even so, in that experience of fear, I know that I've had individuals who, um, have sought treatment outside of base um, for PTSD related to deployments, right? And they're seeing a civilian provider and they're telling that civilian provider about, you know, the issues or experience that they had in their deployment where maybe they killed five people or maybe they even had to kill a child or something like that. And the provider is like, oh my God, you did that. Like her expression is like that shock and awe. And so then that does not help the person to want to continue um, sharing their story because the provider appears to be like in awe or you know, so much disbelief behind it. So we do see that. So especially, so trying to make sure we educate civilian um, personnel to not be in shock or awe when um, individuals from the military come and share their stories, right? And then we also talk about the high rates of suicide among this population. Let's see, is there anything else I have for there? Um, also, um, talking about the homosexual uh, males, right? If they were assa assaulted and they are now seeing themselves or they think of homosexual, they may have anger, right? Or hatred towards homosexuals because of that. Um, and then again, we always talk about like substances being involved. Um, you may see that men who have been sexually assaulted or women even who have been sexually assaulted may tend to um, attempt to sexually assault others. So you may also see that. All right, next slide. Now we get into the assessment um, and some just some basic tips for clinicians. Next. So research shows that there's been some studies that show that um, sexual trauma victims favor routine screenings for sexual trauma and other forms of interpersonal violence. Uh, many clients, patients do not disclose a trauma history unless they are asked. So if you don't ask them directly, they're not going to experience it. It, it has also been our experience Sometimes you'll see statistics for veterans and then you'll see statistics for active duty members and it's like extremely higher in the veteran population where maybe the VA did this research or this study and it's lower on the active duty. And it's because active duty members tend to wait until after they have been separated for the military, discharged, um, and then they will report their sexual assault when they go to receive care at the VA. Um, so you also want to begin the assessment with the presenting problem you want to make sure that you build that rapport with that client. And that rapport um, is ongoing because, you, again, we're working on building trust. A lot of times you may be the first person um, that the uh, victim 
has shared their story with or even told about their sexual assault. Next slide. And then this is just some ABCs for conducting the assessment. Again, you want to acknowledge the, the potential discomfort. So again, modeling for your clients that if you are uncomfortable, you know, you can tell them I'm uncomfortable. Maybe this is my first experience with sexual assault, but I am here to listen to you. I am here. I have empathy. I want to show empathy. We don't want to show sympathy, right? But we want to show empathy for them. We want to be um, direct as possible and precise in our language. We want to show them that... Um, that we have this uh, understanding, but we also want to engage them and have them um, to not rush them to tell their story, but to take their time to share their experience and to clarify the reason why you're asking questions. So don't just throw out all these questions and not explain what is the meaning behind this question that you are asking. And again, I already talked about how you may be the first person that they share their story with. Um, and so depending on how you respond is going to dictate how they um, continue to share their story or if they decide to just shut down. Next slide. Also, oh, I'm sorry, go back to that slide. You don't have to go back to it, but one of the, um, we use in uh, DOD, we use the sexual experiences questionnaire, which is a self-report of sexual responses. It kind of asks questions about your beliefs about sexual um, assault. Have you ever experienced a sexual assault? Um, consensual activity. So we use that as a way to also gauge a sexual trauma in the military. So the DOD does use that. All right. Now, you can go to the next one. now this is, um, I wanted to put this out because when I was doing my research, um, I did find that there was some barriers that we as clinicians create for um, victims of sexual assault, knowingly and unknowingly. We might not even know that we're doing this, but so I thought this was important to just kind of demonstrate or show you. Again, we talked earlier about this gender bias thing. So we kind of talked about that earlier in the video with the men. Um, and we thought that there were women telling their story. And so that can deter you from reporting um, if you already have this notion about what, who is sexually assaulted or who can be sexually assaulted. Um, we may start to do that victim blaming. Lack of empathy, just being insensitive or dismissive in our responses. Or maybe we don't have enough information. And so then we provide inaccurate information about the reporting process. So then that also prevents them from disclosing. So if I tell you, um, no, you don't need to go to the SARC, you go to mental health, and then they go to mental health, and mental health says you got to go to the SARC. So then they're going around in circles trying to get the proper help that they need. That can prevent them from um, reporting, and it creates a barrier. And then we also have, again, we already talked about the judgment that can discourage you if you're judgmental. And then let's say if you have um, cultural sensitivity, just making sure that you understand um, the individual's culture that are uh, walking into your office, like the video show where the um, the Hispanic male was talking about how, you know, the machismo, you have to be a uh, male. And also in Asian culture, it's very tab taboo also to talk about uh, sexual assault. And so to talk about that in their culture, it is, um, it brings, a, this degrades the family or brings shame to their family and to them. So they may, be, may be a little bit more hesitant to disclose it. And if you're continuing to press, pressure them and pressure them and not, not acknowledging their cultural differences um, and you're not culturally sensitive, it can't shut them down. So acknowledging the differences in culture is extremely important. Um, and not taking the story seriously, which means you just have that dismissive attitude that also can lead to distrust and reluctance. And then if you have um, limited training, so if you don't have the training in trauma, specifically military sexual trauma, this could lead to misunderstandings and inadequate information and support. So you want to make sure that um, when you are working with this population that you do have training um, in trauma, specifically even so military trauma, because again, military is trauma. It is trauma. And I used to come from the mindset that trauma is trauma, but it's really not. Because um, again, we have that institutional betrayal trauma. We have that interpersonal trauma. Um, we have relationship betrayal. So we have all of those different traumas that can't impact us uh, differently. Any questions about any of that? I see if I missed anything. Oh, the power dynamic, the hierarchy of uh, the military can create, again, this power imbalance causing survivors to feel uncomfortable. Again, it goes back to, and I'm going to keep focusing on that power dynamic because it is very important in the military because everything is ran um, by authority and it is all based on your rank. 
So here is just crucial for first. Um, we ask clinicians to get the proper training to ask questions. If we don't understand, it's okay for you to let your your client know that I don't have the answer for that right now, but I can get that for you. Um, again, because that builds trust. Any questions about any of the barriers that clinicians can create? Nope. All right, next slide. And then these are just some tips that I thought would be useful. Um, Again, just believe, believe, believe. No matter how um, far-fetched the story may appear, right? Believe them. Again, uh, create that environment of safety, of trust for them to feel comfortable sharing their story. You want to validate their emotions and their reactions. Validating their emotions can be powerful, right? A powerful anyway. Showing them that you understand, um, even though that's not your experience, but you do have that empathy to understand and validate that they're not crazy for feeling the way that they feel, but this is a normal response to an abnormal situation, reiterating that. And then again, documenting thoroughly in their um, record because again, um, there needs to be some history of documentation. Because again, we go back to, if there is no documentation, if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. And so if you don't document appropriately, and then now this person is trying to go get help with the VA and it's never been documented, then it makes it a little bit more difficult for them to uh, get services through um, the VA. Um, again, gently approaching them, letting them go on their comfort zone when they're comfortable sharing, let them share as much or as little as they uh, want to. And that goes back to that trauma-informed approach where we create the safety environment. We are collaborating with them, helping them to be a part of the treatment, letting them know it's okay to ask questions. So we're doing a lot of modeling for them because like we said at first, this is probably the first environment where they are experiencing um sharing their story but also now you're creating to them and showing them that this is a safe place and that you can share free of judgment and then again just being sensitive to the barriers of disclosure um because they may have been unsupported previously which is what we kind of talked about if we saw someone and they was like that didn't happen to you or for real that and you start to respond like that they're going to shut down so just be sensitive to the barriers that we create as clinicians um, when we are uh, providing service to our clients. Next slide. And these are the treatments that we use uh, in the military um, for sexual assault. These are the main two treatment modalities that we use, which is cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure. The only difference is, um, are you guys familiar with the prolonged exposure and CBT? Prolonged exposure, they are writing their um, event um, and they're constantly, you know, writing it and reading it, writing it and reading it. Um, and then the um, cognitive processing therapy is again the same thing, except for they may write it down. We can do it. We can do a written account of the event or not a written account. It just depends on um, what the therapist decides to use. But it is more so the cognitive restructuring and, and obviously in cognitive processing therapy. But they're both approved by DOD, and we're also um, starting to see and use a lot more of the EMDR therapy as well. Next slide. And then we have a scenario. So do we have time to do the scenario? I think we do. What I want to do is just break you off into groups with this scenario in mind and just maybe spend five minutes because we're almost done. I only have like a few more slides left. That's fine. But before we go in the breakout rooms, if y'all could take a picture of the scenario so that you'll have it while you're in the breakout rooms, that'll help a lot. So I'm going to leave this up. Um, so take a picture of the scenario. And then they also have to take a picture of the questions after the scenario. Okay. So I'll give you time to, if y'all could do a thumbs up or anything, get off mute. Let me know that you took a picture and I can go to the next slide. We good on this part, y'all? Awesome. Okay. And these are the questions. So based on that scenario, you guys are going to go and ask yourself these questions. What are concerning behaviors related to retaliation? Who is in their position to intervene? What barriers might they face? What are realistic options for intervention? And then how can leadership support um, airmen and guardians? Because, you know, we have the space for it now. And preventing retaliation. Yes, 
All right, so everyone hopefully was able to take a picture of that. All right, we're gonna do breakout rooms. Um, I think five people per room is fine. Do you wanna do more than five? No, that's good. All right, should be about four to five people in a room. We're gonna give you five minutes. I'll bring y'all back in time. All breakout rooms have been open. Um, for those who have not went into the breakout room, any issues with going to the room? You don't see, Regina, do you see your room? I don't know. Maybe Regina stepped away. Mm -hmm. And come, come off the, I don't see it here. No. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good, good. You're not having any issues? Hmm. All right, I just kicked him out. Okay. Oh, I probably should have paused that. Mm, please edit that out, y'all. Okay, so for those of you who are back, um, if you want to just uh, share what you guys came up with in your groups, you can just pick one person or somebody can just unmute from a group and just uh, share what they um, came up with based on the questions. Do we need to put the scenario back on the screen? Oh, yep. Sorry. Let me go back to the scenario. There you go. You want the scenario or the questions? Um, we can put the, we can put the questions because they know the scenario. All right, so who just wants to, um, feel free to unmute from any group uh, and just share. What is, first of all, what do you think about the uh, scenario? Should I change my scenario? Feedback, people, feedback. I thought it was very realistic. I agree. Okay. And so for those of you guys who um, tell me kind of what's the first question, what are uh, concerning behaviors related to retaliation based on that scenario? We said that the message that was written on the car and the social media threats. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. Anybody mm -hmm. else? them not wanting to re-enlist. Okay. Because of what happened. Because of what happened, yes. Okay. Anybody else? Who is in a position to intervene in this scenario? Based on the information that you got today. Um, um, security. <laughs> secure, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. SARC um, commander. Yep. Yep. Mandated reporters. We say it. Yep. Mandated reporters. Secure. Yep. All of those. Yes. If he has a victim um, advocate. Yep. Victim advocate. Definitely. Any other sapper staff um, to intervene and help? What are some barriers that they might face? What are some barriers that the individual may, may face? Yeah, they can't prove that they was assaulted. 
Okay. Yes. Not being able to prove it. What else? We biases. What biases? Yes. Yes. Okay. What what type of biases do you think they may experience? Um. Well, I think I think in the scenario already was a man, and yeah, correct. so um, I'm just thinking about when we saw that video. You know, my my bias. I thought they were um, um, females and ladies and stuff like that. So yeah, biases. Yep, very very correct. That biases again. That whole uh, male. Uh, we're in a, a male dominant men are supposed to be able to control them control you know events men are not necessarily sexually assaulted if they want if they if it happened that means that they wanted it so all of those barriers to reporting um that whole stigma is also a barrier that stigma uh to reporting the fear that no one is going to believe you is also a barrier anything, anybody come up with anything differently we said um basically along the lines of confidentiality confidentiality because clearly somebody told someone something for it to be out so the barrier barriers of people already knowing and they don't even know who who has this information who's been sharing it with others correct that's a very good one for that confidentiality barrier now everybody knows and they don't even know we don't we can't separate the facts from the false right at this point but now he's being ostracized um and now he's not even going to enlist in the military anymore. all right what uh, are realistic options for intervention I think you kind of said something when you said who's in the position, they kind of go with the options. But what are some options for intervention for this uh, man? From leaving, for one. Mm -hmm. Like getting a temporary command and getting legal counsel. Yes, good one. What else are some options? We talked, somebody talked about the, who's in the position to intervene. You said the SARC or the SHARP office, the sexual assault office. Yeah. Um, that's an option for intervention. He can also request what we call the expedited transfer. Maybe move to a different location. Um, first, he has to decide if he wants to do a, well, at this point, everyone knows, so it would have to be an unrestricted report, but he doesn't have to participate in the um, for, uh, legal proceedings or anything like that if he chooses not to. Um, but he also does have that option as an intervention. And then we said... Oh, go ahead. We said maybe even putting like a dashboard camera in his car mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to try to catch the perpetrator. Okay, I like, I like. Um, thank maybe you. getting the um, maybe requesting the data from the um, social media. Oh, I, I like how... that one. I didn't even think yeah. about that. But how would you? How would you get that? I don't even know how. Would... But that's. Really I don't good. know. Investigate. But we'll figure it out, right? Investigate. <laughs> I mean, right, because you know, OSI they can't get into people's accounts. You know, like our um, office of special investigations, they're able to get into accounts and get data. So that is possible. Mm -hmm. So yes, federal government. <laughs> right, you know, government. We got access to all things. Don't let them fool you. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, delete that part out of the thing. No. How can leadership support eminent guardians in preventing sex, uh, preventing retaliation? What do you think? So, what are the think some things that leadership can do? um to help be supportive i'm sorry what did you say Ms. leadership can be supportive of them oh Don't yes you. supportive uh-huh definitely supportive they can keep them separate like as soon as they know this is going on the command should go ahead and find ways to make sure that they don't have to interact with each other make sure that their barracks or aren't the same they're not rooming together nothing like that and at least limit interaction until the temporary or um, expedited orders can be done. Mm -hmm. So I can definitely do a, a protective order, um, a no contact order to separate them, correct? Definitely. Also, even, you know, couldn't they, go ahead. Couldn't they have, um, I was just thinking like when they have their, 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 um, and when I was in the Navy, we would have, in the morning time we would have caught i forget what it's called but we will all come together and um uh, when the leadership is there telling you what their expectations of the day they can have a mass gathering of that and tell the whole unit Esther. yes mm -hmm. thank you thank you they can tell the whole unit we're not tolerating this and everyone's on the same page that is uh, excellent Amen. because again if they hear it from leadership 
right? Because it start, everything really in the military does start with leadership. If my leadership doesn't condone it, and I know that my leadership doesn't condone it, and when they do see it, my leadership is giving you paperwork. You're getting a, a LOR or a LOC. Like, you're getting some type of paperwork. You're being reprimanded for this behavior, then they know that it's not tolerated. It's yeah. not tolerated in the military. We do. We, we really practice zero tolerance, and we don't just say it, but we're showing it. So, but yes, that's, uh, the, that's the, the one. The command can give curfews and restrictions. Like if incidences happen too frequently, they can lock it down. And no one likes that no, at no, all. No, no, no. It usually starts to make people fall in line or share information that they know or whatever, because you don't want your freedom limited because this one person has done something that's completely inappropriate. Yes, yes, that's, that's a good one. And I think it's important that even leadership is aware of like their own personal bias, um, because if they're not aware, um, then that's going to influence kind of like how they perceive things. And then if others are looking up at them, then it's going to all kind of fall apart. So I think that's something that they need to be aware of as well. Yes. And now we even have uh, we have culture sensitivity for leadership. We um, have a special um, training for, on sexual assault, specifically for leadership, right? Um, to teach them how to deal with sexual assault, to help them to deal with retaliation, to help them be able to identify it when they see it. So we do have a training specifically for our leadership and for our um, just general service members. And then we have a training for leadership. So definitely being able to recognize your own biases will dictate how you respond to someone else. And it goes back to the continuum of um of um harm that we talked about earlier. Someone was gonna say something? Yeah, I was gonna say another important thing is for the leader um is to be aware of resources that may benefit that person that's going through it because um being unaware of resources um that fit that person needs at that time, it kind of puts like a I don't know what to say. It kind of puts like a damper on it, like really not feeling as supported. So the mm -hmm. more resources that that leader know that could help that person through that um, situation can provide to them at that time. So I think it's important for leaders to know about their resources. Yes, that is definitely important because if you don't know the resources, where are you going to send the person to? And then you, like I said, you send them to the wrong person. I always tell people, if you don't know all the resources and this is sexual assault, send them to the sexual assault or victim advocate. Send them to that office, right? Or send them to mental health um, because they usually know, like sexual assault representatives, they know the, the resources that are available to a sexual assault victim. Mental health clinic and mental health providers in the military know the resources that are available to a sexual assault victim. and if I don't know the resource I know where to take you to get it you know so if I don't know particularly know the details I can send you to the SART and they know the details so that's that is extremely important to make sure you know the resource because again that like you said that creates a barrier um to help seeking right if my commander don't know the resources and he's sending me over here to talk to the first sergeant and the first sergeant don't know the resources because maybe they don't listen in the briefings um, because a lot of times the military, in my experience, is that they are very um, reactive and not proactive. And sometimes we do these trainings, every, annual trainings every year on sexual assault, suicide, domestic violence. But if you don't, if you're not directly impacted by it in the military and it's not happening to someone in your unit, you just kind of not really listening. You might be on your phone, you know, you have to listen to what they're saying um, because it's not impacting you right now and then. And then when a situation occurs in your unit, then it's like, oh my God, I got to get, I need to know these things. And so now you're calling everyone because you wasn't listening to that training, right? But again, you weren't being proactive, you were being reactive. Anything else before we move on? We're almost done. And the next slide will go pretty quick. All right, so next slide, we're just going to talk about the resources that are available. Um, so if you were around in 2017, we didn't have a lot of these resources. If you were around in the 1980s, we definitely didn't have them. In the 90s, we didn't have them. Um, so now um, for victims, uh, we have a lot of options for them. So of course, we always had medical care, right? Um, so we have medical care. You, they're allowed to receive, and we encourage uh, mental health uh, services for your, for your military members and your dependents, right? Because if you have a dependent that's 18, um, they can also file a SARC 
uh, an investigation. I didn't cover that in my thing, but if you have a depend, they can also utilize the uh, sexual assault response coordinator services um, for civilians, GS civilians. So GS employees, we have the um, EAP, and they can also use local resources. Um, and we have the uh, VA military sexual trauma number, you know, that is now 988, which makes it really easy because who can remember that 1 uh, 800 number when you're in a crisis, right? So now we have 988 option one for specifically for military members. And we also have the victim's council, which is um, legal representative for the victim. So they deal strictly with the victim. That is their, their uh, legal counsel. Next slide. And now um, victims of sexual assault are allowed to take convalescent leave, which is non-chargeable leave. So the military gives you 30 uh, days a, a year of leave. Um, and so now if you have experienced a sexual assault and you need to take some time off um, for healing, for treatment, medical appointments, those kinds of things, you can now do that and it does not go against your uh, 30 days of leave. We also have the DOD safe line. I talked about the expedited transfer, which allows members to be able to PCS or um, relocate to a, even a different organization on the base or to move to a whole different uh, base. And you can only get the expedited transfer if you um, are doing an unrestricted report um, because unrestricted report means that you are um, following charges uh, and you are requesting legal represent you want help. If you are doing a um, restricted report, you don't want anyone to, you don't want an investigation. Therefore, you you don't fit. They assume you don't have any fear for your safety because that's why you're doing the restricted report. You just want to get services such as medical care, health care, um, those type of things. And then we also have, like we talked about, the military protective orders, and we also provide civilian protective orders that are in place that commanders can do the military protective order. Um, and then you can also go to the civilian sector, the legal system in the civilian, and you can get the protective order as well. Next slide. And these are just some services that are specifically I thought was important if you are dealing with male victims of sexual assault. Here's just some organizations that cater to men that are beneficial. We watched the video with the one in six today, um, but they have a ton of uh, resources, a peer group. They also have a peer, peer support group on their website as does uh, Men Thriving. Next slide. And then these are just some local uh, resources or not local, but resources that we also use uh, for our military population. Um, and some of them are national resources that we use. And I think that's it. All right, does anyone have any questions? Concerns? Y'all ready to go to lunch? Any comments of additional information that you would like to see in the future regarding this topic? Um, for Dr. White to come back or anything. Thank you, Christina. She said it's amazing. <laughs> great information. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great, great. Thank you, Ms. Henry. And yeah. And thank you guys for participating. Um because I did start off with these technical issues because I have been spoiled on women in the military because normally when I do a presentation in the military, I have someone doing my tech for me, you know? So I have become a little spoiled. So I got to be a little bit more independent. And That's okay. I got, your back, you I got your back when you're here. I got your back when you're here. But again, um, my contact information is at the end of the slides. And I think that you will get the slides. Um, do you do you give the slides out? But if not, my and I was going to ask me. you, would you like to um, make something for me to distribute, or do you want okay. me to give them your slides? How, how oh, I can make, I can make something. Okay, sounds good, sounds good. So um, everyone, uh, real quick before you get off, um, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. White. Thank you for this information. It's greatly needed. Um, we will have Dr. White back in October because she will be going over the ACEs and the military. So we get some of the average childhood experience studies and how it's parallel with the universe. Not the universe, Lord, with the military. Oh, God. Sorry, y'all. Probably the universe, too. We're going to figure out about the universe. So thank you so much, Dr. White, for that. Thank y'all for coming. Before you get off, please go ahead and put your uh, first and last name. And if you're not with Western Tidewater, put with what agency you are with. 
um, first, last name in your email. So I can distribute the handout that Dr. Wright will give us and I can distribute your um, certificate of completion. So go ahead and drop that in the chat. And thank y'all. Thank y'all so much for uh, being with us on this fine Friday.